Hey everyone, it's Dr. Mitchell. Trapped in the Walmart parking lot here, I'm out running errands. I had to get my fruit snacks for my vitamin C and glycine. If you get fruit snacks, don't get the Welch's, those are trash. Get the Black Forest, they're the best. Um, yes, giving my money to Walmart, shame on me. Whether or not you think you should or should not give your money to Walmart, you should at least come for the experience. A vast array of humans come to shop at Walmart and you get to see all of the peculiarities that make mankind very beautiful. And so it's quite amusing walking around Walmart just for that alone. All right, what are we talking about today? We're gonna to talk about an interesting case and we're gonna tie that into Scleroderma. Okay, so the case, a little bit of backstory. So middle-aged woman, PCP found a positive ANA. What did she have going on with that? She had fatigue, fevers, small joint pain, stiffness, swelling, particularly in the mornings. She has a cough and some chest pain, and she's got um, abdominal pain, particularly pelvic pain. And when I hear that symptom picture with pelvic pain, I usually think endometriosis. She's getting some things sorted out with her gynecologist, so maybe, maybe not, but I think when I hear this sort of thing, endometriosis is on my mind. Okay, so she gets referred to rheumatology. She goes to one of the biggest rheumatology clinic, actually the biggest rheumatology clinic in the nation here. She sees a rheumatologist. I know this woman she saw. She dropped the ball, shame on her. She really needs to change the way she practices. I will not name her because I respect her. Um, but essentially she ran the patient's labs again. ANA came back with some other things and the symptoms persisted and she essentially told the patient, you are not sick enough for me to treat you, come back in six months. Really? Really, doc? What the F? Okay, so this patient's had persistent ANAs, the symptoms have persisted, this has been going on for some time. Okay, and so you've heard me talk about ANAs before, very sensitive, not very specific. You can stub your toe and get an ANA, and so unfortunately a lot of providers treat a little bit too conservatively. There's a really interesting study that was published at a JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, tracking military personnel with vague symptoms. Positive ANAs, they tracked these folks over several years. A substantial fraction of them went on to develop autoimmune disease, a connective tissue disease. And so, in this sort of context, where we've got some symptoms that persist and the ANA is persisting and there's no other reason, we need to address things more sensitively. We need to be less conservative. We need to get the ball rolling because we don't want the vague picture to evolve into a specific connective tissue disease. We don't want it to wear a hat. We don't want to get there. And so, uh, yes, she was not satisfied with her care. She found me, she came to me, I looked at her, I reran her labs, the ANA persisted, maybe there was a rheumatoid factor, I don't know what else came up, and um, she had another peculiarity. She had a lesion on her thigh, which was biopsied and turned out to be morphia. What is morphia? Morphia is a skin manifestation that's thought to be immunologic in development and associated with autoimmune disease, particularly scleroderma. Did this lady have a sclerodermic picture? Definitely not. Maybe this dry cough and chest pain was related to pluripericarditis or um, maybe early interstitial lung disease. I know that's a far cry, but I listened to her lungs looking for something we call bibasilar crackles that can be heard at the bottom of the lungs. Her lungs were clear. Her chest scan was clear. Okay, so probably not. What did I label her with? I labeled her with UTCD, undifferentiated connective tissue disease. I said that backwards. UCTD, undifferentiated connective tissue disease. What does that mean? She shrugs. What does that mean? What that means is I know which aisle of the grocery store you're in, but I don't know where on the shelf you go. Okay? The disease has not decided to wear a hat yet. Okay? And that's okay. We don't want it to wear a hat. We don't want to know exactly where you end up on the shelf because that means things have progressed in advance and this has evolved into something specific and it's further along in the disease course. And it's much harder to manage things that have developed and are developed. It's better to address things in this earlier developmental phase, okay? You've heard the saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure and so we we're gonna do something about this. We're gonna get something going, okay? Something should have been done earlier. Hydroxychloroquine, talk to you about your diet lifestyle, anything. Something should have been done. What did I do for her? So we put her on an elimination diet. 
okay? I gave her naltrexone, and I gave her a homeopathic remedy called sepia. Why sepia? When I hear about pelvic pain, I think about sepia for women. And there were some peculiarities that ranked this remedy above others, particularly with her perspiration. She's been told it smells very pungent, like onions, like garlic, like yeast. I combined that with her other symptoms in the repertory, and sepia ranked one, so she got sepia. She came back several months later. She was a different person. 15 pounds of weight loss, probably inflammatory edema. She was doing much, much better. All of her symptoms went away, with the exception of a little bit of some pelvic aggravation that persisted. Okay, so what did she have? She's got something undifferentiated. Maybe it'll evolve into scleroderma. That, that morphia was really peculiar, but we don't want to find out. We just want to address things now and put the brakes on things, and so we did that. And I like to think that we are averting something that could develop in the future that could just wreck her life. Okay, so let's talk about scleroderma now. What is scleroderma? It's a very rare autoimmune connective tissue disease, okay? Have you heard of the CREST syndrome? We don't call it that anymore, but CREST, calcinosis, Raynaud's, esophageal dysfunction, dysmotility, sphincter dysfunction, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasia. Okay, sclerodactyly, what is that? So you get this skin tightening, can affect the hands, the feet, can affect any part of the body, the face. If it's more distal, hands and feet, that's a better prognosis. If it's closer to the trunk, you get skin tightening closer to the trunk, worse prognosis. Need to be plugged in with a specialist immediately. At any stage of the game, you should be plugged in, but definitely if you have proximal sclerodactyly, telangiectasias, little spider web formations, uh, of, of veins that are broken, can happen on the face, can happen on any part of the body, okay? Antibodies, what are the antibodies we look for? ANAs can be there, rheumatoid factor can be there, rho and law titers, but mostly ANA, and then there's some specific ones. Antitopo isomerase, or SCL70, if you've got that guy positive, that heralds a worse prognosis, okay? RNA polymerase 3, if you have that guy, it predicts kidney disease. What are the scariest parts of scleroderma? It can affect any organ system in the body, but we really think about lungs and we think about kidneys. You can get interstitial lung disease. The immune system will attack the lungs, fibrosis and scarring of the lungs. Remember that bibasilar crackles I was listening for? That's a feature, dry cough. If it gets advanced enough, you can't breathe and you die, or you get pulmonary hemorrhage, pulmonary arterial hypertension. The kidneys can be attacked. You get this onion skinning that happens in the glomerulus, and there's this vicious cycle where that, that apparatus gets destroyed and the kidneys fall apart. Sclerodermic renal crisis. We watch closely for blood pressure changes and changes in your kidney function. We use ACE inhibitors to manage that. Life-saving. Really high doses, higher than what we use to control normal hypertension. Okay? So kidney, lungs, and then the Crest syndrome. Okay? Um, what else do I want to say about scleroderma? How is it treated? We treat it with DMARDs and immunosuppressants and biologics. Okay, there isn't any really good 100% treatments for scleroderma. There's some new investigation being done on stem cells, which seem to be promising, but uh, the hunt is still on. So hydroxychloroquine to help with the joint manifestation excuse me, joint manifestations, some of the skin manifestations. There's mycophenolate mofetil or MMF or CELSEP, which is used for the interstitial lung disease. Um, there's prednisone, which you can't stay on chronically, so we try to mitigate our use of that. You might get pulsed cyclophosphamide, which is a chemotherapeutic agent to get you out of a bind. And then I've heard good things about rituximab from a friend of mine who's a specialist in Gilbert. And so rituximab, rituxin, that's a B cell inhibitor, he's seen that avert rapid progression and help control the disease. So something to talk to your rheumatologist about. Off-label use for scleroderma, rituximab. Okay, what do we do naturopathically? We're gonna change your diet. We're gonna look for food sensitivities. We're gonna address your hormones and make sure those are balanced. Things are a little bit more complicated there with est estrogens. Estrogen is normally thought to drive autoimmune disease. But there's some evidence that certain estrogens might modulate the immune system and calm down the disease. Toxicants, environmental toxicants, heavy metals, lead, arsenic, mer mercury, things like this. Uh, solvents, pesticides, you want to check your home environment, your work environment. Those are things we're looking for, chelation agents if needed. 
Scleroder scleroderma, more than any other autoimmune disease, is highly associated with environmental toxicants. Your, micro your microbiome, dysbiosis, we want to look at that and make sure things are balanced out. A disrupted microbiome can cause autoimmune disease, but a manifestation of scleroderma is dysbiosis. You get, you get hardening and dysmotility of the, the GI tract, and you can develop things like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or small intestinal fungal overgrowth. So that needs to be identified and dealt with. And then obviously nutrient deficiencies. There's other modalities we have like homeopathy, acupuncture. This is a good combined approach. You want to be plugged in with a specialist if you have scleroderma. I normally don't take that one on myself. I won't treat patients unless they're plugged into a specialist. Okay, so... Remember scleroderma, remember Crest syndrome, remember the lungs, remember the kidneys, remember that it can be a really mean and nasty disease and you don't want to take that one on on your own. And then remember, huge, if you have an ANA and symptoms that persist and you go in and somebody tells you that you're not sick enough to be treated, fire that doctor's ass and find another doctor. Enough said there, this is Dr. Mitchell signing off. Remember. Even if you don't like Walmart and giving them your money, at least go to see Human Peculiarity. It's a lot of fun. Everybody have a good Sunday. Dr. Mitchell signing off. Bye-bye now.